And on this morning, I want to talk to you about love. And when I was first, you know, um, talking to God about this, you know, he first gave me this word, I was like, love, you know, people, you know, that's, that's something, you know, that's just, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm falling around in my head. You sure God, you're preaching on love? And like, yeah, I need you to preach on love. Love is something that, um, we is lacking in this, in this world right now, big time, which is why we see all the lawlessness and the murders and the killings and all the other things that we see going on in the world is because of lack of love. It's going to be a little different to us because when I actually sat down and started studying it, God brought it to me a different way than what I thought he would. So the title of today's message is Love Opposes. Love Opposes. And, and what does that mean, love opposes? Well, the word oppose means against or it, it, um, it argues against certain things. You know, love um, actively resists or refuses certain things uh, that you just can't put in the same definition or in the same place as love. And we're gonna look at the love chapter on this morning, but I'm only going to focus on a few verses. Uh, but we have to go there and to set the stage. This is this is uh, First Corinthians uh, chapter 13. If you would go there, and you all have heard um, this chapter on love many times, um, love can be a challenge to define at the level of how a person experiences it. Love can involve personal affection. It can involve, involve sexual attraction, platonic admiration, brotherly loyalty. It can be about benevolence and, and giving. It can even be a worshipful adoration. But to accurately answer the question, if someone were to ask you, what is love? You're going to come up with a lot of different things. I remember a Bible study that Deacon Damon taught and I don't know if that was this year or was it last year, but he taught on love and he asked us the question, you know, what is love? And I can remember all of us saying so many different things, you know, but when it, what it comes to what it really is, when it gets down to the nitty gritty, the origin of love, the Bible tells us that love is God, that God is love. So if anybody really want to know, if anybody asks you, what is love? You have to say God. And I know that's not the answer they're going to be expecting. And they're going to want you to expound on that. But you can put a period behind that. Love is God, period. He is love. He doesn't just love us, but it's who he is. His very nature is love. That's it. But in the most basic sense for us, for human beings, love is the emotion felt and actions performed by someone concerned for the well-being of another person. Let me say that again. Love is an emotion that is felt and actions that are performed. Actions, that's an action word. Love is action. God is love. He is action, you know, performed by someone concerned for the well-being of another person. Love involves affection compassion, care, uh, self-sacrifice, those things, if you listen to those words, that's who he is. You know, self-sacrifice, he sacrificed his own self through his son by laying down his life on that cross for us. So a love, so love originates uh, from the true and Godhead within the eternal relationship that exists. And that eternal relationship is God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you can find that over in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. If you guys return there, 1 John chapter 7, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. That's your first scripture there I want you to turn to right now. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. And it reads, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not 
love does not know God, for God is love. So I'm going to have to let you guys let that sink in for a few minutes. Sister Nisha, grab that scripture for me. I'm going to get her to read it from the, uh, I forgot, the NIV version. But it's, just let it sink in. This is John speaking. He's saying, dear friends, let us continue to love one another. Why? Because love comes from God. And then he says, anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. So if you love, you belong to God. You are a child of God and you know God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. And you cannot know God. Why? Because God is love. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. I'm preaching already. Just getting started. Amen. Go ahead, Sister Tanisha. Yes, reading from the NIV version, it reads, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love, does not know God because God is love. Amen. God is love. Amen. Loving is unique to the human experience of being an image bearer of God. No other creature on earth has the ability to love the way we do. You can love your dog, your cat, but your dog and your cat cannot love you back. They don't have that ability. The only people we were both, we were made in God's image was us. And he's the only, we're the only ones who can love the way God loves as an image bearer of God. No other creature on the earth has the ability to love. I know that probably hit some of you a different kind of way when I said your dog don't love you. Your cat don't love you. No, they don't. They don't know what that is, but they are loyal to you because of who you are and what you're doing for them. Come on, somebody. John was very clear when he taught on love, very clear. And if you continue to read, Sister Tanisha, uh, starting at verse nine, right where you are, and go through verse 13, you can see some other things that he said. So sorry, I was trying to have trouble getting off of you. He says, starting at verse nine. Yes, you stopped at verse eight. So continue right there to, through verse 13. Among us, is sent as one and only son in the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that, excuse me, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son at an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete within us. You said 13? Yes. Okay, that was 12, so 13. This is how we know that we live in him and that he lives in us. He has given us his spirit. Amen. Come on now. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Holy Spirit is very important to, when it comes to love. You can't love the way God requires us to love if you do not have Holy Spirit or not allowing Holy Spirit to live and work in you. And you can only have Holy Spirit if you are a child of God. You can only be a child of God if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you do not have Holy Spirit because without Holy Spirit, you cannot have Jesus. Without Jesus, you cannot have Holy Spirit. So this is real love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins this is love and then in first john chapter 4 verse 16 it reads first john chapter 4 verse 16 says we know how much god loves us and we have put our trust in his love god is love and all who live in love live in god and god lives in them Amen, somebody. 
Now drop down to verse 19. You're in 1 John. First John just, he lays, he's laying the foundation of love. He's letting you know what love is. You're in 1 John chapter four. Now drop down to verse 19. It says, we love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, let me say that again. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is what? A liar. For if we don't love people, we for if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. This is the command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Period. You can't say you love God, but then you don't love your fellow believers. You don't love your brothers and your sisters that are in Christ. How many churches do we know where they're in there and they, they hate one another? There's so much bike biting, so much fighting, so much hatred, so much, so much confusion going on in the body of Christ. Why? It's because they don't love God. The Bible says it clearly. This shows that they don't love God because they're not loving one another. And he has given us this command, verse 21 says, those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Read it in your Bible. First John chapter five, verse one. First John chapter five, verse one says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, has become a child of God. Oh, somebody help me. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the father loves his children too. So Jesus himself says that love for God and neighbor are the most important commandments. On them, all the law and all the prophets depend. Loving God, loving your neighbor, loving yourself is the greatest commandment at all, of, of them all. All the other commandments depend on that one, love. So any study of biblical view of love must consider Paul's extensive exposition of the virtue in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As Deacon Damon get 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to read those first few verses uh, and, you know, this passage is a favorite text for many people and one of the most frequently read passages at weddings. We're very familiar with it, so familiar that if we're not careful, we can be blinded to how short we fall for this standard of love if we are not careful. The kind of love described in 1 Corinthians 13 is based on the love of our creator himself, which is never anything other than perfect. And he calls us to be perfect. And he calls us to love the way, the way he loves. And he says, if you don't love that way, then you don't love me. Holy Spirit is not in you and I'm not in, and, and you're not in me. You're not a part of me. You can't be a part of me if you don't love because I am love. I am perfect love. I am pure love. So the love of God demonstrates these characteristics flawlessly that Deacon Damon is about to read. While our attempts to love this manner, if you don't have Holy Spirit in you, would never measure up. Would never measure up. Come on now. Come on, Deacon. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Chapter 13. And I'm reading from the King James Version. And it reads, though I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains 
and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity, charity suffereth long, is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not have, be, uh, behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hope all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. Where there be, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake That's of good, Deke. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So he's, Paul is going through, all the way through verse 10, from verse 1, and he's explaining what love is. And the reason why Paul is having to do this, if you go back and you read chapter 12, uh, you can see in this whole Corinthian, this letter to the Corinthians, the Corinthians were just acting up. They were doing all types of things in the church. And he had to lay down some instructions, instructions about public worship. He gave some instructions about the order of the, of the Lord's Supper, you know, which we give, you know, when we do Holy Communion. Uh, He's talking about spiritual gifts. I mean, Paul had to go through, you know, uh, the, the, the body parts of the church and explain, you know, how all the parts come together. And then after he does all of that and he explains all those things, he says, all oh, this is great and awesome. You can prophesy. They just, they were just fussing and arguing over who can speak in tongues and everybody wanted to speak in tongues and everybody wanted to prophesy and everybody wanted to be, you know, wanted to know what was the, what was the greatest gifts and, and they wanted to have the greatest gifts and they were just going on and on. And it was just a bunch of chaos in the church. Read it for yourselves. So Paul had to sit, set them straight, send this letter. And he said, all the spiritual gifts and it's good if you can speak in tongues. He talked about the spiritual gifts. He named them all out. And he talked about the body of Christ and having, you know, yes, the body has many parts and not just one part. The, the foot can't say that I'm not a part of the body because I'm not the hand. That does not make it a lesser part of the body. He says the ear can't say I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye. Would that make it any less part of the body? Then he says, the whole body, if the whole body was an eye, how would we hear? If the whole body was an ear, how could we smell anything? He says, your bodies have many parts and God's body is the same way. There are many parts. Not everybody's going to prophesy. Not everybody's going to be an apostle. Not everybody's going to be a teacher. Not everybody's going to have gifts of healing. Not everybody's going to have a gift of leadership. Not everybody's going to speak in tongues. Not everybody's going to have all these things. He says, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown language? And he says, of course not. Not everybody's going to have all these gifts. He says, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. And then he says, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the very last verse, which is verse 31, before he gets over to verse over to chapter 13. He says, so, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you what that most helpful gift is. And that's when he starts talking about the greatest gift of all is love he says if that's why he says if you could all speak in all the languages of the earth and of angels but you don't have love 
you are you are nothing. If you could prophesy, you are, but you don't have love, you are nothing. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed and you can move mountains, but you don't have love, you are nothing. If you gave everything you own to the poor and you sacrifice your body, but you don't love, you have nothing. So he's telling us no matter what type of gift you might have, no matter how talented or gifted you are, if you do not have love, you are nothing. He says, and this is how you're going to know if you have love. Because love is patient and love is kind. But what I want to talk about this morning is the rest of that verse four. I want to talk about the things that love opposes. He said, love is patient and love is kind. Then he says, Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. Love is not pride or prideful. Love is not rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable or upset all the time. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not rejoice about injustice. So those are the things that I want to talk about. And I'm only going to be able to hit two this morning. And the two that I want to talk about this morning is that love is not jealousy and envy. And with that goes pride and arrogance. The Amplified Version says it this way. It says, love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. And here's the part I want us to focus on this morning. Love is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. Those are the ones that I'm going to talk about this morning. It is not jealous. It is not envious. It does not brag. It is not proud and it is not arrogant. We'll hit rude and not seeking, self-seeking and all those at another time. Amen, somebody. So we want to talk about that because there's a lot of jealousy going on in the body of Christ. There's a lot of arrogance. A lot of preachers get so freaking arrogant. And I did say it that way. When they, when they start growing and the ministry is growing and they got this and that and the other you their head blows up you can't tell them a thing that's not of god that's that's paul saying no 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 paul says though we might be extraordinarily gifted and have great theological understanding we gain nothing if we don't have love you're in the pulpit you you have a thirty thousand dollar thirty million thirty thousand uh members i was just about to say fans because that's basically what a lot of pastors see their members as fans yeah thirty thousand fans <laughs> in your congregation you have a great understanding of all the feel like you get up and preach a great message you're extraordinarily gifted but you don't love the people so using the gifts of god without showing love to others only proves that we have forgotten the great gift giver himself who is pure love and when we do this what we have done is we're we're replacing god in the church with idols with men most people idolize the pastor they want to be in with the pastor they want to be a they i laid out my life for the pastor That's not, that's backwards because the Bible says the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You can't make idols out of these people. You can't do everything for the pastor and then the people are going without, they have nothing. So love is not envious or boastful or pride or arrogant. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse 4, Part of the description of love is a list of negatives that love is not, that love opposes. A few of these negatives are just things that we got to, we have to understand that if you are doing this, if this is who you are, that's not love. 
Amen, somebody. So near the beginning of his outline of love's character in this verse, these are some interesting comments that Paul makes. Envy is, is an easy sin to hide because we can keep our mouths shut about what we are feeling in our hearts when we see others getting blessings or, or, or having things or doing things that we want to do or that we long for. You, a person can't really tell as you're envious about them if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're smart about it, but you can be harboring it in your heart. It is therefore important to be consistently considering our inward attitudes and confessing them before God. And maybe even before your brothers in Christ, who you trust. I will never forget years ago when I was in church and this young lady, we were both upcoming pastors, uh, uh, ministers, I'm sorry. We were both new uh, to ministry and we did our initial um sermon and you know i got up and here i am you know just this, this type of teacher that you see this thing flat footed and teach and she got up there and she was all charismatic and you know jumping around and you know kind of hooping a little bit and you know she was had the crowd all worked up the whole time i was preaching everybody just sitting there taking notes writing nobody hyped up or doing any of that but when she got up there they was hyped up and doing their thing and I, I kind of felt some kind of way I kind of felt jealous about that sister Tanisha let me tell you that thing bothered me I had to go home and I had to pray and I had to ask God to make certain that I do not let that grow in my heart amen amen and I had to go to her and I had to say to her, tell her how great she did. And, and I even had to confess that I, I actually started feeling some kind of way. I have, you know, feeling a little jealous, a little envious when you were up there, girl. But you know what? I had to take control of that situation. It's a human thing, but we got we to gotta confess that. That's a sin. We have to confess that sin to the Lord and to let the Lord wash that thing, cleanse us of that thing. Because it don't, we don't, the last thing you want is for envy and jealousy to take root. So confessing before God and even before the person or somebody you trust to say, hey, you know, so and so and so got this, or so and so and so taking all these trips, you know, and looking on social media, one of the biggest liars in the world right now and looking at their platform and they're, they're in Mexico and they, they're over here and they're in Dominican Republic and they're on this lavish cruise and they're on out in the Arctic and all these things. And you see this stuff and like, well, dang, I want to, you know, and you start being envious. Be very careful. Envy can lead to all manner of sins. And so we must ever strive to keep it in check. Envy will cause you to run up your credit cards trying to do what somebody else is doing. Cause you to steal but trying to do what somebody else is doing. Neglect your family and your friends trying to do what you think somebody else is doing. We don't keep that in check. Be very careful with that. The Greek word translated envy means to burn with zeal. Literally, the sense is to be, is to, to be heated or to boil over with envy, hatred, or anger. So in the context of 1 Corinthians, the idea is that love does not focus on personal desires. It is not eager to increase possessions. You just want, 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 want. You're never contented. God's type of love is selfless and, and, and it's not selfish. Envy is the opposite of God's command that says, do not covet. That's the commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Don't covet. Don't want what your neighbor had. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 21 is, is the command. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house his field or his male servants. Let me put that in a more today's version. You must not cover your neighbor's wife. You must not cover your neighbor's house or land, male or female servant, ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And your neighbor could be 
not just the person who lives next door to you, but anybody that you can't covet, you can't want, you know, oh, she has, he has such a beautiful wife. She's so fine and sexy. I wish I had a wife like that. And next thing you know, you over there, you know, trying to get in on it, sliding in their DM. This is what you cannot do. Amen, somebody. So love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans chapter 13. Start turning in your Bibles. Romans chapter 13. Verses 9 and 10. Tells us. For the commandments say. Romans chapter 13. Verses 9 and 10. Tells us. For the commandments. The commandments. The commandments say. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you're doing that, loving your neighbor as you're loving yourself, all these other things that are before that I just said you must not do, or that God says you must not do. It says, love, when you do that, you're fulfilling all those other commandments. You're fulfilling that I will not commit adultery. You are fulfilling that I will not murder. You are fulfilling that I will not steal. You are fulfilling that I will not covet. If you love, you won't do any of those things, the Bible says. Love does, love does no wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirement of all all of God's laws. And there, there were many in the Old Testament. But if you love, every single law is fulfilled. There's no way. You don't have to worry about committing adultery. You don't have to worry about murder. You don't have to worry about covetous, lying, stealing, any of those things. If you love, you have already fulfilled every single command. The one who truly loves will be in conformity, will conform to the Ten Commandments and, and envy will not be a part of your life. So the Corinthian believers were ranking some spiritual gifts as more important than others and envying those who had the, what they considered the best gifts. You can read that in chapter 12, but Paul points out that the different gifts are meant to serve one another and build up the church, not to serve you and to benefit you and to make you money, but for the church. If you are gifted and you are serving in the church as a believer, those gifts are not for you. Those gifts are for the body of Christ. Those gifts are for the believers. Those gifts are for the church. No one person has all the gifts. But each child of God has at least one of them. But every child of God should have love. Love demands that each gift be used to serve others rather than yourself. And the Bible says, Sister Tanisha, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, what does it say? When we crave what someone else has rather than being grateful for what God has given us, we actually hurt ourselves. What does it say in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30? Instead of envying, envying others, we are called to do what? To love them. We are called to love them. When you envy other people, when, you have, when you're jealous of other people, you are hurting yourself. And here's why. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. Amen. The NIV version reads, a heart of peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Amen. It rots your bones. Envy causes you to decay. Envy causes you to, to lose. It's like cancer to the bones is what the New Living Translation says. If you have a peaceful heart, that leads to a healthy body. A peaceful heart. You're not envious, you're jealous about anything. Your heart is at peace. That's going to give you a healthy body. But jealousy and envy 
It's like cancer in your bones. And it's going to eat away and eat away and eat away. Amen, somebody. The Bible is very clear on these things. A calm and undisturbed mind and heart are the life and health of the body. But envy, jealousy, and wrath are rottenness of the bones. So true love, God's love rejoices when, rejoices when others are blessed. You want to rejoice with them. You want to be happy for them. You don't want to be envious because somebody else gets a brand new car, God blesses them, or a brand new home, or get, you know, look a certain way, or have a certain husband, or have a certain man, or have a certain woman. You know, you, you, you want what you want a man in your life so bad, like sister so-and-so and so that you run out there and get anybody. Just to say you have a man and live in the most miserable life ever. There's no peace in your heart. Your bones are rotting. There's no room for envy. Love does not seek to benefit itself. And it is content with what it has. Because it focuses on the needs of other people. Not so much your own needs. You, you, you're supposed to rejoice with others when God blesses them. When God is blessing your brothers and your sisters, what are you upset about? Don't, be, don't have a jealous heart. Don't be envious. A spirit, John Edwards once defined envy as a spirit of dissatisfaction and or opposition to the prosperity and happiness of others. Why are you opposing others' prosperity and others' happiness? What is wrong with you that when somebody, God blesses somebody else, you are unhappy? What is wrong with you that when God blesses somebody else, you are upset? You oppose their prosperity and their happiness? Seriously? Therefore, an envious heart plainly violates scriptures instruction on love it reveals covetedness that ungodly dissatisfaction with what we have and causes us to lust for what belongs to others and that's a sin envious people are unable to rejoice with those who rejoice and that's what romans tells us he says paul says rejoice when others rejoice when we are envious of others blessings guess what we're doing we cannot take joy in their abundance, which means we cannot truly love them or what our father is doing in their lives. You don't get to dictate to God what he does in others' lives. Would you be happy if they were down and out? Would you be happy if they had nothing? Would you be happy if they didn't get the business, if their business failed? Would you be happy if you saw them broke down on the side of the road and then have a car that was running? Would you be happy if they didn't have food in their refrigerator? Would that make you happy? Check yourself, check your emotions. What is wrong? There's something rottening inside of you if you feel that way. Come on, somebody. Love that does not envy refuses to be jealous of others who are blessed in ways that we are not. It is content with the Lord's provision in any circumstance. And I'm gonna give you some scriptures that you can write down to help you in this situation. Um, and uh, well, before I do that, let me just move on to the next one. Uh, and, th then the, and the next one that I want to talk about here is boasting. Love does not boast. So, so you are blessed. So you do, God has given you the finer things. So you do have money. So your children are doing very well. So you have a great husband who adores you. You're driving the finest cars. You love the Lord. You have what seemingly you have it all. You have no worries at all. In 1 Corinthians 
chapter 13, verse four, it talks about boasting. And it says that love opposes boasting. It does not boast. So near the beginning of this outline of love's character, Paul tells us again that envy, boast, pride, none of that is a part of love. And then he goes on down here when he starts talking about the boasting part, what does he say? It is easy to become a cause of another person's stumbling when we are prideful, uh, and we have such a behavior that every time we're around people, we want to brag about what we have. You do it in such a way sometimes where it's like, God bless me. So you, you, you package it in a different way. But what you're really doing, uh, Paul says, is you're bragging and you're boasting. Those who manifest godly love do not make their own achievements into idols. And they, do, and they do not build up their self-esteem at the expense of others. Some of you, people cannot say anything, cannot tell you anything good about their child or anything good about what happened to them at work or anything without you having to come back and tell them something good about your child, about what happened to you and your job or what you did. You always steal the glory from somebody else. You never just give people a chance to just talk about themselves and their achievements. And there's nothing wrong with it. If you're not boasting, it's fine. But if you're boasting because you're trying to make yourself bigger than what you ought, the Bible says that is a sin. So the Bible says, so, so you, if you got to boast, then boast about what? Boast only about the Lord. Deacon Damon, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 31, there, there, there's reasons why that, that the Bible gives that you can boast, but there's only one. There's only one reason the Bible gives you that you can boast. And it says it in several different places in the Bible. So those of you who love the boast, boast, but boast on this. What does it do? First Corinthians chapter one, verse 31, and it reads on this wise, that according as it was written, he that glorifieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay, so do you have another version that uses the word, he that, what does your version say, Deke, again? I'm so sorry. Uh, King, King James says uh, glory, uh, glorify. Glorify, okay. Glorify. If you're going to glorify, if you're going to boast, boast what? In the, the Lord. In the Lord. And it says scripture say. I don't know if your, your Bible has a reference to tell you which scripture he's referring to. But there's a scripture that he's referring to. And that scripture is Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, if you can get it. Paul saying, don't glory. If you got to boast, if you got to glory, the scriptures say, boast in the Lord, glory in the Lord. What scripture is he talking about? Jeremiah uh -huh. 9 23. Jeremiah 9 23. And it reads on this wise Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might let not the rich man glory in his riches uh, verse 24 says but let him that glorifieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me that i'm kindness which exercise loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things i delight saith the Lord. This is the Lord speaking. Thank you, Deke. It says it's right there. Thus says the Lord. Don't let the wise, don't, if you're wise, don't boast in your wisdom. If you're mighty and strong, don't boast in your might. If you're rich, don't boast in your money, in your richness. If you have to boast, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. 
That's what you boast in. That's what you take glory in, that you know me, God says, that you know that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, who practices justice, who practices righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight in, declares the Lord. So if you're going to boast in anything, boast in God. Are you boasting in the Lord? How many of you are boasting in the Lord? Come on now. James chapter four, verse 16 says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Boasting in your arrogance, that's evil. Come on now. I know I'm, I'm preaching this morning because this is gonna help us be better. Sometimes you think that you're, you, 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 you got it all together, but just certain things you're still doing. You're boasting, you're arrogant. And you wanna say, well, I'm not arrogant, I'm just confident. Okay, well, confident in what? D, Proverbs 27, two. Proverbs 27, two. Well, one and two. Proverbs 27, one and two. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody, turn to the turn to these uh, scriptures, write these scriptures down. If you know a Christian or a person who who lives this type of life, every time you're around them, they boast and they're bragging, they're they're grandizing, self-grandizing. These things we we can't have take part in that. That the Bible says love opposes that. That's not love. Go Proverbs ahead. Verse. Proverbs verse 27, verses one and two, and it reads, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what day a man bringeth forth. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. Come on now. Let somebody else praise you. Not your own mouth. Let a stranger praise you. Not your own lips. Psalms 94, 4 says they pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. Boast about who they are. Boast about what they have. Boast about this. Boasting about that. So also the tongue is a small member, James says. Yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Your tongue can set a forest on fire. By, by boasting you think to yourself well, what's wrong with that i mean why is it so because what's wrong with it it doesn't show love it doesn't show you lifting up and glorifying god it shows you lifting up and glorifying yourself for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a, not a result of works so that no man, no person can boast about it. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 31 says it again. Paul says it again. So that, so that you know, let no one who boasts boast and let anyone who boasts boast in the Lord. Amen, somebody. So like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. Mm. Proverbs 25, 14, he says like clouds and wind without rain. You got the clouds and you got wind. It's so cloudy, the wind is blowing. The Bible says that's what a man is like who boasts of a gift that you didn't give. All your gifts comes from the Lord. So that's why he says, if you're going to boast, boast about that. Come on. And Galatians chapter six, verse 14 says, but, for, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
So anytime you want to boast about something, anytime you want to be braggadocious about something, the Bible says, make certain that it's in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and not in yourself. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. David said, and they, in Psalms 34 too, he says, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. So you want to make certain that when you, you, you living, a, you're showing love at all times. And in order to do that, you have to make certain that you are walking in complete love. You're not boasting. You're not being arrogant. There's scriptures about arrogance as well. I'm going to give you a few and I'm going to get on out of here. Um, ver verse one, uh, 1 Samuel chapter two, verse three, you can write it down, says, take, talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth for the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. It's not about what you, your mouth says, it's your actions that God weighs. It's your actions that God is concerned with. First Samuel chapter two, verse three. Come on, somebody. And then Proverbs chapter eight, verse 13 says, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech. God says, I hate it. He says, I hate pride and I hate arrogance and I hate perverted speech. Come on, somebody. Agree with the word of the Lord. Agree with it. Just agree with it. Just say amen. Come on amen. now. Amen. Amen. And Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13 says, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11 says, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. God does not like arrogance and pride and bragging. He just doesn't like it. First pride, the Bible, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, first pride, then a crash. The bigger the ego, the harder they fall. Now that came from the message bible because the, the 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 new king james says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall well i've always had trouble trying to understand that scripture pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall so i had to find a version that i could understand it and the message bible helped me to understand it it says first pride then the crash the bigger the ego the harder they fall and I get that. I understand that. So that's why I threw that particular uh, message scripture in there because I want to understand what it is that I'm reading because I want to make my stuff better. I want to be who God has called me and is calling me to be. And I know you do too. And these are messages that we need to hear. Maybe we, they don't, we don't want to hear them, but these are messages that help us evaluate ourselves and to know, am I really walking in love? You know, there's a there's a there's a uh, there's a, a story in the Bible that is worth reading, and it really talks. It really gives you a great understanding about what God says when He was talking about bragging and boasting. And again, that Greek word translated boast means to brag or to point to yourself. That's what it means in the Greek. Boast means you're bragging and you're pointing to your to yourself. In contrast to the kindness and patience mentioned in the beginning of the verse, boasting is not a mark of love. You know, again, it's another word for being proud and arrogant. And many theologians believe, Deke, that pride, not drunkenness, not adultery, not murder, is the deadliest sins of them all. It's pride. It's not drunkenness. It's not adultery. It's not stealing. It's not murder. It is pride. That is one of the deadliest sins of them all. For it was pride that led to Lucifer's rebellion. In Isaiah 14, 14, 
And the first couple's attempt, Adam and Eve, their attempt to usurp God's authority in the Garden of Eden, it was pride. Many other sins originate from pride. God's warning that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall is illustrated again and again throughout scripture. And one of the most notable stories that I thought that I could use this morning to bring a clear understanding to what this is, is King Nebuchadnezzar, mm. Babylon's King Nebuchadnezzar. You guys remember him. And it begins with his boasting and continues with his downfall, and but it ends with his confession. So after being duly warned by his prideful nature, by the prophet Daniel, duly warned by about his prideful self, by the prophet Daniel, God sent Daniel to tell King Nebuchadnezzar about how proud he was and that he needs to cut this thing out. King Nebuchadnezzar stood after, after the, <clears throat> excuse me, after Daniel explained all this to this man, go there, Daniel chapter four. <clears throat> Let me tell you, this man stood on the roof of his palace, got up top and praised himself. He started boasting in himself, dig Daniel chapter four, verse 30. He said, it's not this is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence as for the glory of my majesty. Read your version, D. He said, I'm telling you, can you believe it? Now, now he had already been warned. Daniel chapter four, verse 30, and it reads in the King James Version, the king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the mighty of my power and for the honor of my majesty. All about him, his power, he built it. It's all about his majesty. He wasn't boasting in the Lord or anything. And then the Bible says immediately, God judged his pride. And for the next seven years, the once grandiose monarch, groveled about on all fours in the manner of a wild beast while grazing on the palace lawn. God took him from the roof of the palace and put him down on the ground. And he was on all fours. He was on his hands and his knees groveling around like he was a wild beast. For seven years, from regal to rags and from the banquet table to the mouth a father on the ground. King Nebuchadnezzar completed a seven year course on the dangers of pride and arrogance and bragging and jealousy and envy because it's all rolled up into one and the virtues of humility. He had to learn to be humble. So how then do you overcome the grievous sin of being both, having boastful pride? First, we must understand that boasting and pride alike are similar to dangerous. It's just like a dangerous narcotic. It's, 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 it's addictive. It's detrimental. And it's just not good for you or anybody. Nobody wants to be around somebody that's always bragging. Somebody that's always arrogant. Who, who name a person to think of a person like that. You'd be like, oh my God, every time you turn around, this, the more we feed pride, the firmer it, 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 its grip gets a hold of us. Pride is repulsive. Nobody wants to be around a person who's always so prideful and puffed up about everything. You can't tell them anything. They are, they are just prideful. They're just arrogant. And no, it's not just confidence. It's exactly what God says it is. Once we admit that pride has a foothold in our lives, then we can confess this sin to, to, to the Lord. And it's just like any other sin. And once we have confessed, confessed the sin of pride, then the Holy Spirit can begin correcting our faults and molding us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, who was humble until death. And he, if anybody had a reason to boast, it would have been Jesus, but he never, you, he never did. He stayed humble until the end. So what happened? We've, he ended up 
aren't coming to his senses. He understood what was going on around him. The Bible says he came to his senses and to overcome pride, we must praise the Lord. So he covered, he covered in dew and reeking with seven years worth of filth. He didn't take baths. Seven years out there on that lawn, everybody, his, everybody watching him, looking at him, looking at him. Hey, wasn't that King Nebuchadnezzar? Look at him. This, he has lost his mind. He out here on the ground eating with the cattle, eating dirt and grass. Wow, can you believe? Wasn't a king? Yeah, imagine. But at the end of the days, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. My, my, I returned to myself. I remembered who I, who I really am. And I blessed the most high and I praised and honored him who lives forever for his domain is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, King Nebuchadnezzar said, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. The moment he came to his senses about who he was and who God was, and he relinquished what, to, what belongs to God unto God and accepted that God is the creator and that God is the king, the everlasting king from generation to generation, that he is the most high and he is the only one to be praised. At that moment that he came to his senses, that's when God restored to him his majesty and his splendor. He says, my counselors and my Lord sought me and I was established in my kingdom once again and still more greatness. God even gave him more greatness at that point. He says, and still more greatness was added to me. He had to come to his senses and he had to understand that he could not be prideful and he could not be arrogant and he had to know who God was. And when you act live with pride and arrogance, you are saying that I don't know God. I don't know that God is above me and that everything that I have belongs to him. He says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, King Nebuchadnezzar said, he is able to humble. Come on, somebody. So you better bless God that if you are walking in pride, understand God is able to humble you. Now he prayerfully, he won't put you out there on your all fours, but trust me, he's able to humble you. He can call some things to happen in your life where you have to get on all fours, but you're getting on all fours in adoration of who he is. Be careful. Pride is, could be your detriment. Humility is for our greater good, not pride. Perhaps a final component of overcoming pride is a sincere, heartfelt desire for humility. And always be humble before the mighty hand of the Lord. When we realize the immense blessings of, of humility, you're going to long for it. There's blessings in being humble. The reason that love does not boast is simple. It's because love is focused on the people that it loves, loved ones and not yourself. A braggart is full of himself, always magnifying his own accomplishments and too occupied with, with self-aggrandizement to notice other people. Love turns the perspective outward. A person with God's type of love will magnify others and focus on their needs and not so much on your own needs. You just don't want to be a, a braggadocio type person. Always talking about you. And the last scripture that I want us to read, uh, Deacon Dame is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. And then I am done. And you can take on the service from there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 14, verse 1. Just understand that boasting is unloving and sinful. Arrogance, boasting, envy, jealousy, those called to reflect Christ, we should strive for the same attitude 
uh, of Jesus. And that is showing people love and drawing people, you know, to, to, to God by the way we live our lives. Amen. Go ahead, Dee. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse one, and it reads on this wise, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. What was it say? What does it say again? Uh, for, uh, it says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Amen. Let love be your highest goal, is what my version says. Let love be your highest goal. Follow out the charity. That's what you want to get more than anything. But you should also desire the special abilities of, that the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. So then he goes on and talks about other things. So in other, of all the things that you get, make certain you understand that the highest goal of all the, the one thing that fulfills all the commandments is love. Love is it. Pride, envy, arrogance, all of that. Rudeness, unforgiveness, anger, all of this is, is not love. And if you're keeping account of wrongs, if you continue to read, and 1 Corinthians, we're going to talk about this later. I said, it even talks and it does not rejoice at injustice. It does, it's not overly sensitive about everything. It does not take into account wrongs endured. It, you, don't, you keep the records of everything somebody do wrong to you. The Bible says that's not love. And it's certainly not forgiveness. If you keep in record, then you're not truly forgiving and walking in forgiveness. So I'm done, Deke, and I, I have preached my soul out this morning. And I am praying that, you know, it was not for naught. In Jesus' name, amen. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that there will not be room enough to store it. Ways to give, as you see on your screen, um, is uh, we have our website at www.asgcc.church. We also have our cash app, which is uh, dollar sign ASGCC. And you'll see the church emblem there. Um, you have to download the app if you don't have it. We also have Tively app where you can go on and lo uh, locate our church's awesomeness of God Christian church, or you can send a uh, check or money order to P.O. Box 1592, Riverview, Florida, 33578. Amen. Thank you. As far as our announcements, um, we would love to have everyone at our Wednesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock. Bring a friend um, and come prepared mm -hmm. to digest and and break down the bible in a way that is fun and that we can understand it so that we may be able to carry that word with us and use it in our in our lives in a way as i mentioned we can understand it so again wednesday night bible studies at 7 p.m and our regular church services start on sundays at 10 a.m thank you for our morning announcements and i will lead us out in prayer Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for switching up this, this service this morning. And we yes, ask Lord, you, that Lord. you just bless everyone on this call right now with what it is they need, Father. Give us the patience, Father, to, to have us to wait and, and have it be done in your in your time, Father. Yes. Lord, everything is perfect when it's done in your time. And we say thank you right now. We thank just you. ask for those patience, Father. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you just bless our families on this call. Yes. And we just bless just our lives in general. We thank you, Lord, for thank what you. you have blessed us with so far, Father. And even if you choose never to bless us again, we oh, say thank come you. Come on now. Thank you. We Lord. thank you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, you're an awesome God and so, so worthy to be praised. Yes. 
yes. we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, we Lord. thank you, Lord, for this church, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you just continue to bless us and the church, Lord. In yes. Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 And, and, and I'll just say, we're studying the book of Nehemiah on Wednesday nights, and it is an awesome, it is an awesome study about um, leadership, you know, godly leadership. So if you, we're on chapter six, I believe coming up this week, if you want to read ahead and then join us, love you guys. And to God be the glory. Remember it is well.